So welcome everybody. Uh, this is Society 2045, Friday Talks. This, what we're trying to do here is bring people together with different views of making a, a better world. And, um, and to accumulate enough of these to have people hear what other people are saying. Uh, we don't have the answer. The answer, we have an answer. Uh, and other people have an answer as well. And we hope it's by putting it all together, we can come up with it, with an answer that, that uh, will help us survive uh, at least to the year 2045. I have Brendan Martin with me. And in a few minutes, I'm, I'm going to give him a chance to introduce himself. And uh, he's got a very interesting background with uh, an association with uh, Bursock and um, Brendan, why don't you introduce yourself? Certainly, Matt. Thank you. But thank you very much. And it's great to be here. So I'm Brendan Martin. I'm, uh, I'm a London Irishman. Uh, and I have spent uh, about the last um, three or four decades working to uh, improve the working lives of uh, people all over the world uh, in um, a small and modest way. Um, which has taken me around uh, 70 countries uh, and finally brought me back to London uh, where I was looking after my mum towards the end of her life for the last two or three years of her life and witnessed daily the challenges of uh, preparing to die but also of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the health and social care services which were available to us. And at the end of that experience, I realized that my whole professional background and experience had kind of converged with my personal experience and produced a determination to do something to improve neighborhood care uh, based on what I knew could work from my experience around the world. That's to say, self-organized neighborhood teams that don't need managers, but do need support. And I looked around for examples, if there were any of what I was imagining, discovered Bürtzog in the Netherlands. And for the last five or six years, I've been working along with Bjotsov to uh, bring to Britain and Ireland, uh, and increasingly internationally, uh, the lessons of its experience and my own experience more broadly than Bjotsov to, we hope, uh, create more caring neighborhoods that can care for themselves more effectively, more joy and happiness in working lives, and to be able to do both of those things in ways that are financially sustainable. Uh, so that's our mission. Uh, and that's what I do. So what was the problem that you saw uh, with your situation with your mom? What was very interesting about my mom was first, first the first things I noticed was that, um, so I had power of attorney for my mom's affairs and um, one of my responsibilities was to organize care for her because I couldn't be there all the time. She had be, my, my dad had died 15 years earlier or 10 years earlier or something. Um, and she had not, she had, her personality was not great for getting, keeping up with neighbors and so on. So she was quite isolated apart from family. And uh, so, but I couldn't be there all the time. I had other things to do and my own small children at that time or almost grown up children by that time and work and so forth um, but I only lived on the other side of London so I would come and go very frequently but I arranged uh, professional uh, home care for her and she required that increasingly she got a certain amount of support from the state but the the, the bar is set very low for means testing for social care uh, in, in Britain. Um, so really, it was a question of buying in the care that she needed. And what I saw from that was that in the main, the women, and they were women, from all over the world, because they were from all over the world, who 
were supporting my mum in her day-to-day -day life were in the main compassionate, committed, thoughtful, intelligent women who were trying to make a lousy system work the best they could. And when I talked to them about what they did in certain situations, there was a light bulb moment for me actually one day when uh, they'd been I'd been frustrated because I had to get through to the agency that employed the home care workers that supported my mum. By the time she died, my mum needed someone sleeping in the house every every night, and um, I couldn't. There was a problem. I couldn't get through to the agency, uh, and the agency. Uh, so I said to the my favourite one of my mum's care workers, Yasmin, her name was, uh, Yasmin. Is there a secret number? I can nobody ever answers the phone at your at your offices. Is there a secret number you can give me? She just laughed and she said, "No, nobody ever answers the phone for us either." So I said, "Well, what do you do when you got a problem? Like, for example, if you the care you're giving to somebody they've had a fall or something, you can't rush on to your next call." And these are women who are maybe given fifteen minutes, half an hour for each call, and then rushing on. And she said she picked up her cell phone and she said, "We call each other," and. What I realized was that the organizational dysfunctionality that she was having to work against every day and the systemic uh, lack of integration in the services was to some extent being overcome by the creativity and the um, um, imagination and the commitment of these, of these women. So what I thought was, well, look, if this is what actually happens, why not actually create a system which builds on these strengths and eliminates, eliminates all of the unnecessary complications and weaknesses? So it was that really that uh, that was the light bulb moment for me, Matt. That's, uh, man, you mentioned it was painful, but it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, we, have, we have an even bigger mess in this country. Um, but uh, let's not talk about that. So how did you connect with, um, I'm going to mispronounce it, okay, but Berzog uh, and, and that, that way of doing things? So um, I worked for many years, as I said, in supporting change in um, particularly public service organizations, but other organizations too, um, based on, and here, you know, this is going to be somewhat, uh, I don't like the vocabulary, but just to get, to get straight to the point and not waste time. So, so based on mobilizing the intrinsic motivation and the tacit knowledge of, of people who work. So for me, the, the theory behind this is that there is a huge body of, uh, particularly in public service contexts, a huge, a huge body of intrinsic motivation that is not only not mobilized properly, but undermined, uh, in many organizations, but even more so a huge body of tacit knowledge, experience, trained intuition, if you like, that in many, if not most organizations, simply isn't even understood or valued, uh, certainly not mobilized and um, encouraged. Um, and this work had uh, taken me around the world. And one example was uh, in Indianapolis, actually, where um, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, back in the day, I think now we're talking 20 years, maybe slightly more, um, the, there was an election for the mayor and the mayor that won was a Republican mayor. Um, his name was uh, Goldsmith. Uh, and he went on to be an advisor, in fact, to one of the Bush administrations. And he came into Indianapolis on a platform of, we're gonna outsource everything. We're just gonna have four guys in the, in employed to manage the um, to, to manage the contracts, everything else can be outsourced to, to companies. And it so happened that these the th things like road repairs uh, and waste, waste disposal uh, were done by a largely male workforce in Indianapolis, um, who were also very well organized, very highly unionized, uh, unionized in Ask Me, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and what these guys basically said to the mayor was, over our dead bodies, you ain't gonna do that. These are our jobs. And so that was one lesson was they were strong enough to say that and for that to be taken seriously. But unlike many unions, certainly in Britain and I think around the world, they also were smart enough to say, however, 
we have got our own ideas about how you might be able to improve this service and reduce uh, inefficiencies and cut out waste. So that combination of being strong enough to stand up to the to, to the to privatization intentions of the mayor and creative enough to have some ideas about actually how the waste could be improved and how the service could be and the quality of the service could be improved was a was a winning combination. So they ended up uh, developing an approach to uh, improving services based on drawing out from those who actually do the work, really having the knowledge about what the work involves, where the waste is, but they're not going to tell you that if you if the consequence of telling that you that is that they're going to be fired. So information like that, knowledge like that is a hugely valuable asset that working people often for their own best interest, hold to themselves and not ready to share. But if you create an environment in which there is sufficient security and shared purpose to enable those assets to be mobilized effectively, the results can be fantastic. And they were in, the, in Indianapolis, so much so in fact, that the mayor ended up reducing the amount of outsourcing in, in Indianapolis and winning a prize, uh, the JF Kennedy government prize from Harvard, for creative government uh, work. So all very effective. But the thing that's remained with me to this day, when I asked one of the guys that did the work, uh, what this meant for him. And what he said was, it means I no longer have to park my brain at the door when I come to work each day. And I thought, well, that's what it's about. It's, it's about valuing your working life, your contribution to the city uh, and enabling those things to be to be uh, to be really valued and uh, organizing uh, the way in which work is done on that basis so that's a long way of answering your question how did I hook up with Bielsa which but the reason was that by the time it was that kind of experience that enabled me to imagine what I would like in neighborhood services community services uh, and to want to do something about it. Um, so, so I then looked around the world to find, well, is there anybody doing it the way I'm imagining it? And uh, that's how I found Bjutsov, which was founded in 2007 in the Netherlands. By this time, it's tw in, in my narrative, it's 2014. So by that time, they've been going about seven years. I found out about them. And I think, God, this looks interesting. Not only are they doing what I'm imagining, but they're making it work, they're making it successful, and they're growing. I've got to find out more. So I, I went to the Netherlands, um, got to know Jos de Bloch, who is the founder of Bjotsov. He very kindly uh, welcomed me um, uh, and um, uh, arranged for me to go out and shadow one of his nurse teams. Uh, and it so happened at that time, back in London, that my little uh, social enterprise public world had just been commissioned by um, a, a national health service uh, organization in South London to help them to improve their community services. So it was just serendipitous that I said, so I said to Jos, we got this proposed, we got this request to help uh, improve community services in a holistic way. Um, would you come and help? And he said, yes. So he came, uh, we worked together, uh, we developed a program of work and that became, and at the end of that, he said, well, would I be their partner in Britain? And I said, on one condition that it also, I uh, can also be your partner in Ireland. So we did that deal and we've been working together ever since. And by now what we've done is we've worked in around 40 different settings over the last five years or so with varying degrees of success. Everything from just initial inspirational sort of uh, presentations and so on, right through to currently we're working with two organizations that we've been working with for about three years, four years, where we're in an advanced stage of really transforming those organizations to work in a way uh, that is uh, drawing inspiration and um, guidance from Bjotsuk's success. Um, we haven't set up a Bjotsug service like in the Netherlands. What we are trying to do is provide learning and development support and organizational change advice to healthcare 
and increasingly other kinds of organizations in Britain and Ireland. In fact, uh, just this in currently, we're working with a hospice in the southwest of England. We're working with a group of migrant home care workers in Dublin, in Ireland, uh, who are setting up their, started up their own enterprise uh, and they wanted to operate in a Bjutzog way. Uh, we're working with a couple of charities that support people who are living at home with long-term conditions and learning disabilities, uh, mm -hmm. and in three or four other settings, uh, including, and this is the first time we've ventured into this area, in social housing. Um, I don't know if you, what you call that in, in the States, but basically it's housing that's provided by non-for-profit uh, associations. Um, and so we started working in that context too. So we're learning a lot um, about the challenges involved in trying to retrofit, if you like, the kind of approach, the kind of organizational principles uh, that Bjotsog succeeds with into organizations that have been created and have long, sometimes very long histories and very well established and embedded cultures, which are not at all welcoming to it. Uh, Bjotsog was a startup. Uh, which is one thing, um, but trying to retrofit this uh, this this approach is, is another challenge altogether. And I suppose after oh, what is it now five seven years, um, we've learned a lot about that. Yeah, the, what you call the retrofit, which is uh, trying to work with uh, an established company, it's always harder. This starts from scratch, always. Sure. Uh, in fact, I don't, I don't know how to do it. We're trying to figure it out. So let me ask you a deep question that we always ask. So assuming that all your work uh, is successful, and not only that, it, um, it spreads. You know, you, 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 hear, you, you start hearing about it uh, coming up in, in other places that you didn't, you didn't have direct hand on and stuff like that. Uh, what would... 2045 look like in the year 2045 what would it look like so i've thought about that question a little bit of course but that it's um in view of of your focus um but i didn't have to think too hard because i think what it would look like from my point of view was firstly a people would be paying a lot more attention to being good neighbors um creating self-caring neighborhoods that um and creating local economies that are able to sustain self-caring neighborhoods uh in a way that uh, provides people with livelihoods too um now of course that means engaging with the, with the wider world uh and all of those complications but I think we have it in us to do that. So it may sound odd that I'm talking about self-caring neighborhoods when I'm also talking about supporting social care organizations that are doing care professionally. But my answer to that is that actually the solution to the deficiencies of home care with, with all of its weakness, with, with, which is treated as a low value, low wage, low status way of making a living, at a time when demand for it is only growing. Um, the solution to that, in my opinion, is not to not only to give the professional role there a higher status, higher pay and higher value. It's also to change that role in a pretty fundamental way. And the, the, that fundamental way, I think, is to contribute to the enablement and support of neighborhoods to support each other more effectively. So that's that's the kind of vision I have for 2045. What's that in, require? Well, we definitely have economically enough facility, in my view, to finance a universal basic income. And to do that in a way, and, and also for people to be able to work in a paid capacity, many fewer hours than we demand of them now by working smarter and working in organizations that uh, are, are less unequal in their distribution of the rewards uh, coming into that organization. So the conditions in terms of the macro side of things are definitely there if we can succeed in the political 
effort to change the way in which the, the, the benefits of growing productivity are shared. Really, it's about sharing the benefits of growing productivity to create more, more, more equitable environment. But within those environments, I think if we can spend more time with the social connections, which are so vital to our well-being, um, and less time having to worry about making a living, but in that time when we are making a living, doing that in a way that brings us joy and satisfaction. Yes. Uh, I think all of the ingredients for this kind of life are already there. We just need to find ways to organize them differently. Yes. Yes, I quite agree with you. Uh, Jose and another fellow and I wrote a book that basically agrees with you. Um, although not so much about universal income but universal base universal ownership co, co what we call co-ownership um and as an owner then you you be part of getting all the benefits not just uh revenue or anything like that um with that i'm going to open the for the q a session and uh i've seen a lot of activities uh which i hadn't seen before uh, in the chat room um Ben just advertised our our book and um and whatever questions you have you go ahead and and uh raise your hand are you Stuart are you raising your hand or no no oh uh, okay. Jerry go ahead uh thanks Matt um Brendan delightful to e meet you and hear your story um I marvel at how rare a Burtzorg style organization is, despite the fact that it's relatively simple, that it's compelling, that we really need it, that, you know, blah, 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 and yet, and yet it's such a rare bird. Um, are there, gen like, how would you generalize the model to into other areas? Uh, I don't know if that's even on your radar or something you want to do, but I'm really interested in, like, what sorts of infrastructure could be made available that would make your job lighter and easier? Like if you wanted to go start a, a Silicon Valley startup, the, the road is paved with golden bricks for law firms that know how to do this, software platforms that you can use, blah, blah, you know, there's like the whole thing is done. You want to go create something that's equitable and shares results well and so forth. Like it's DIY. You really have to go out there and hunt. And I'm wondering what the component parts are uh, that would be really helpful to your organization so you wouldn't have to go invent everything from scratch. And if you found stuff out there that you didn't have to invent from scratch, fantastic. Could you let us know what it was? Um, yeah, I will. Uh, and vice versa, right? Um, that's a deal. Reciprocal. Um, the, I think... Um, well, of course, it is. It's a great question because I know I'm not because none of us really know the full answer. Um, but what I do know is you're right that it is um, that there is a real glaring contradiction between the simplicity uh, of what of what we try to do uh, and the uh, apparent difficulty of achieving it. Um, some, one of our little uh, catchphrases is that making things complicated is easy, making things simple less so. We've learned a lot about how to support an organization to do this. The first thing we do, and we insist on this, and sometimes and we, we say no to commissions if we don't get our way on this, and on quite a few other things actually, but certainly on this, is we start with uh, how do you see the purpose of your organization or company? So we always start with that. And the reason sometimes people push back on that is they think they know, but the, the, in, in that process, we really discover th how many versions of purpose there are and to what extent people are aligned with it in, in the organization. So we start there. And of course, already then you're beginning to uh, weed out uh, some of those who just are not going to go along with this purpose, or at least to enable them to self-identify. Um, the second thing we all, we then go to is putting in place a framework. One of the 
most um, uh, misunderstood things about organizations that uh, enable and support self-management is that it's all just about saying, okay, everybody, we trust you will manage yourselves, get on with it. Um, so the framework is really important. The framework needs to be based, of course, fundamentally on the purpose, but we support, we, we, we kind of facilitate a process to enable organizational leaders to think about where are the red lines? What are the things that are really important to achieve this purpose? Uh, and we guide it in a direction that sort of comes up with half a dozen points in each of three categories. Not necessarily that many, but certainly not many more. So, uh, and in the, those three categories are, you know, the quality of what you want to do as your outcome. Secondly, the joy and happiness that you want in your workplace as a, as a good thing in itself, but also as a condition of success of your great outcome. And thirdly, what, how you can do those things in ways that are, that are sound financially and in, in sustain and sustainably uh, commercially. And so we, we, we create a framework like that, which is then the subject of dialogue between the organizational leadership and whichever of the people in their organization are expressing the most enthusiasm for giving it a try. And um, we then say, okay, you need to ring fence these people that are gonna be working in a different way. You need to create some safety around them. They're gonna be working in accordance with this framework now. You can ditch all your protocols, your policies, your procedures, your rules, these people are going to self-manage within this framework, but this framework is really going to define, define also the boundaries of their authority uh, in relation to yours. So the, it, you, by creating the boundaries of autonomy, you also create the space for that autonomy to be safe. Um, and then we support the, the, the those professionals themselves who usually don't need much of this, but we, we have some methodologies we use for learning simple ways of self-managing collectively and individually within the framework in a way that doesn't take a lot of meetings, that arrives at consensual decisions without uh, having to spend a day and a half at not reaching one. You know, so, you know, action-orientated con consensual decisions, the methodologies we use, which have worked really well for Björtsog are the same ones that we use in our advice work. Uh, and then the, 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 alongside that, we start to get a, uh, we, we, we put in place around these teams, not only some safety, uh, but also start to think about how you change the way the back office functions of the organization work. Mostly these back office functions would have been designed for and populated by people who know about command and control. So you gradually, you need to start to lift that off the burden, the back of the of the experimental teams, and put in place instead a process whereby what they need is quickly understood by people in the back office, whether it be finance, HR, IT. You know, start to, to get a, a little small service center that responds to those needs, and uh, over time, the, the idea of this is as the number of people working this way organically grows. We're very much opposed to saying, okay, we've done a pilot, let's roll it out, everybody has to do it. We think this has to grow organically. And so the first few teams are made up of the, the enthusiasts. Uh, there'll be others who are a bit more cautious and no, I think I'll see how it goes with them before I join in, but they'll hear that it's going fine or what the challenges are, but they'll want to join in. And there'll be some who don't, don't want to join in, and you know what? Okay, they're not going to be well suited to this changing organization, and maybe they can seek their happiness elsewhere. But gradually, you can you can grow that that experiment into increasingly becoming the norm. And the service center that you put in place to provide good, agile, responsive back office services to it gradually can replace the rest of your administration. So that's essentially the path of development that we try to go along. We don't always get beyond first base. We get to various stages along, but we do. And of course, within that framework that we offer, there's enormous amounts for autonomy, the scope for autonomy. And there has to be, because every single organization is different. So 
So mm -hmm. you, you, but you do, I think, a bit like the framework I talked about within which the, the professionals self-manage, we, we, we approach our work like that as well. Well, here's a framework. We're going to work with you within this framework, but within this framework, we're going to co-create solutions which are the right things for you and your purpose and your organization and what you're trying to achieve. And it, every one of them will be a bit different. So essentially, that's, that's the way we go about it. And I think, you know, at our micro level, what we're learning increasingly is what these building blocks are about. And I think we're pretty nearly at the point where we're able to say, okay, here's our experience, here's the journey, uh, create your own story within these, these parameters. Um, but we're not quite there yet. But maybe in a couple of years, I'll write a book about it. This is really fascinating. Thank you. It's just, it, it warms my heart to hear this, you know. Um, I just had a significant birthday. I'm, you know, like, okay, I'm in third act here and, you know, I don't have anybody, you know, no kids. So what's, what's going to look like when it's time for me to go? And um, I love this idea of, you know, we have traditionally made home care uh, a low level job, you know, that's for people, you know, you, you get paid $10 an hour or something. And um, so it's in the U S there appears to be a very large barrier. How can we, you know, overcome that barrier. The baby boomers are aging out. They're needing more and more care. And the idea that we're going to make home care um, a, a viable profession is extremely appealing. And I'm just wondering if you have any insights onto how we might um, make that happen in the U.S. because we have a very different culture. You know, we don't have a national health service like you do in Britain. Um, got any ideas on how we can roll that out here? Well, thanks. Well, of course, my, my my understanding of your context is very limited, but um, what I do think you have, partly perhaps because of the um, the fact you don't have a national health service and you don't have a welfare state, perhaps you do have a more uh, informal uh, local uh, community supports. I know, I mean, I, I'm not going to idealize that. And, you know, there's a whole number of ways in which US society is obviously very divided. But at a, at a small scale neighborhood level, perhaps there is more of a sense than there is, for example, in Britain, of needing to look out for one another. And that's a pretty good start, if I'm right about that. I think that's important. What One of the disadvantages we've got in Britain is precisely the fact that a sort of dependency has arisen over the last uh, two generations. And I'm gonna sound a bit like a Thatcherite now, but, or, or Reaganite, but it's, whisper it, but it's true, that a sort of dependency has grown, whereby instead of looking out for one another in a neighborly way, we delegate this responsibility to the state or to the local state. And what do they do with it? They then delegate it to some company that pays people minimum wage or less if they can get away with it, that gives them times, ta tasks to do rather than supporting them to build the relationships that are needed to do this care properly. Uh, and you end up with an industry that through which the state is acquitting badly its responsibility so I think in Britain we have to overcome that and but maybe you have a better starting point for that in the United States because I think the nature of the profession of home care has to be one of really doing asset-based community development to enable to see what's strong in communities and we've worked on some of these projects now in in England as well where the, one of the most fascinating pieces of work we did over the last five years was um, supporting what was called neighbourhood care in a couple of uh, lo localities in, in Cambridgeshire in the east of England. Uh, and what they basically did was they created new teams whose role was to make themselves very visible in the community as a source of support, but also to draw to them and go out and find um, where informal supports could be mobilized from. So you don't always have to employ somebody to keep you company. If you can create conditions where the networking uh, can, be, can be done. 
Um, so you might need infrastructure like local libraries. I think local libraries are very important in this context as a, as a potential hub. So you need some sort of physical hub. But if you can create a, a, a lot of community activity around that, the job of the home care professional then becomes to connect people to, uh, and to, to, if you like, to nurture this community, this growth of community assets. Mm -hmm. Will that mean, will that be enough? Well, no, sometimes there will still have to be something professionally done. Um, you know, uh, one of our awful images, isn't it, on, on our own behalf about growing old is that when we can no longer wipe, wipe our own bums. Uh, do I want my children doing that? No, I don't really, you know. If that's got to be done, I am going to pay somebody to come in and do it in a less, you know, in an impersonal way. But that, so there will still be things that need to be done at a professional basis. But a lot can be done by creating more self-caring neighbourhoods. And what a more satisfying job that is than simply coming into someone's home and just doing tasks. If you can instead really build a relationship with people and cr create community assets in which people can help each other. And the great thing about it is, I think we have to do that anyway, because one of the most interesting things about Björtsog's experience as a business is that the, the, the time that a Björtsog nurse or care worker will spend in someone's home when they first are work, working with them will be a lot. They, re, they invest a lot of time in creating that relationship. But you know what? Before long, because of the approach of enabling people to look after themselves more effectively, and to connect with others that can support, uh, that, that can also support them, the number of hours of professional input per client on average has been cut by literally half by Björtsog in the last 10 years. So this more relationship-based way of doing it, a way that also uh, it brings people together to, to, to provide informal support for each other, that does mean re relationship building and investing in the time required for that, but you get a return on that investment pretty quickly, and that makes it affordable. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. And Stuart, you had your hand up. Uh, just I did. To catch that. Um, I did. So thank you, Brendan. Um, you you just triggered some thinking on on my part that I appreciate. Um, in terms of community development and in terms of health, um, you know, the idea of being part of a community, you know, aside from the tasks, has got to increase uh, the sense a sense of well-being and 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 um, that people actually feel. And I can completely understand why they need less um, attention as time goes on. The, the the question that I wanted to ask. At the very beginning of your comments, you said, you know, if we create the context in which frontline workers are not afraid to be fired, they'll tend to be a lot more forthcoming and open uh, with their thoughts. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as another overlay, if you have any thoughts about what this would look like in a for-profit environment. And, and how that factor um, comes in and impacts the capacity to be able to do. There are, of course, there are for-profit environments and for-profit environments. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I run a social enterprise. If we don't make profit this year, yeah. uh, we're, we're not gonna be working next year. Of, so, of um, mm -hmm. but, but on the other hand, is that my primary purpose for this business? No, it isn't. Um, uh, and do, does it need to be a very high profit? No, it doesn't, but it does need to keep us growing uh, as much as we need to, at least keep us going. So, um, of course, that's not always easily done. When you hit hard times um, and you have to keep the business going, uh, those are the test moments for your commitment to the social purpose in any social enterprise. Uh, and sometimes you have to say, well, you know what? For the next three months, we just got to survive. Uh, let's, what do we have to do to survive? 
But if that starts taking over as your modus operandi, as your as your purpose, then then you're in trouble long long term. And I mentioned that because how this happens in different ways to so many organisations that they have, and I think it's particularly bad with charities. Actually, I, that so many charities have started with a, uh, a social or environmental purpose, but by now their purpose is to keep going. And uh, there are some charities that, in my opinion, have become highly corrupted as a consequence of that. Now, in the in to return more directly to your question, in the for-profit environment, so I think there does have to be a sense of shared purpose beyond making profits for the shareholders. Um, I personally wouldn't get my own motivation from working with an organisation that was only focused on. Uh, for on on the the benefits to the shareholders and the pro and those who derive a revenue from the profits um even though i would say that some of the lessons of experience of Bjurtsog and the way that Bjurtsog work could indeed improve their their profitability uh but it wouldn't i wouldn't be motivated to work there but in in general i would say that the approach that Bjurtsog brings uh, and that, uh, as I said earlier, has to be based on shared purpose to begin with, and then you you have to, and and then you do need a framework in which everybody's winning uh, enough. Uh, the the quality of the output, the quality of the working life, and the uh, financial sustainability are all in a reasonable balance. Um, then, yeah, go on. I was going to say. So then, it's it's kind of like a confluence in some way. Of, 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 of self-management, um, social responsibility, and, and, what I'll, and open book management all coming together to create uh, something that's sustainable and actually more effective in terms of delivering whatever, whatever the product or service it is that's, deli that's being delivered. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Uh, and one of, the, one of the issues that comes up for me which I was hoping to, which I want to squeeze into the conversation, is um, what does that mean about do do we therefore need, as part of this agenda, to assume that there also has to be shared ownership? Um, I think one of the one of the conundrums for me, what I notice about, for example, Bielsa, is it's a it's it's a non-profit, um, but it's created by a highly charismatic and inspirational man um, employing a workforce of 97% women. Um, and, and his role as a founder and, and chief executive remains very important. If nobody will really know how important until he's no longer there. But there is definitely a relationship between the vision and the clarity of the vision and the consistency of or a rigorous approach that Jos takes to, uh, to, to being very consistent about the Bjotsog way. And this manifests itself in all sorts of ways. And it's so important. This is one of the things I get a, try to get across to the leaders of organizations we work with, this cons consistent, this consistency. The, 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 when, when organizations are changing, often the, 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 where they get into difficulty is where something goes wrong and things always go wrong. So it's how they respond to something going wrong. Do they then retreat into the old hierarchical relationships or do they see this as a point of learning for how you move on with the new kinds of relationships? This is where Yossi's leadership and clarity is completely uh, important. Now, one of the dilemmas I have myself is how important is that? It, one of the consequences of that is that he has a very high level of clarity about what he wants for this organization. Mm -hmm. And that, in, I haven't talked to him about this, but I think that would be lead him to resist transferring ownership authority yeah. too broadly to even the workforce if it was to undermine his ability to really have his clarity of vision. So the tension I'm, I'm seeing is, is there a, 
um, paradox here that in order to create these self-steering and self-organizing organizations, uh, they may not be highly compatible with distributing final authority too broadly through equally and shared ownership. I'm, I'm asking the question, I don't have the answer. The other concepts I mentioned, let's add servant leadership to it. And, and what pops up in my mind is in so many arenas, we know what to do. We're just not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'll shut up now. And thank you for your inspirational remarks, Brandon. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I hope they were. <laughs> I want to add a comment about ownership is a dear subject to me. And um, it's, it's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, the owner is the boss. No matter how you slice it, the owner is the boss. And the day he dies, his inheritors are the boss. And who knows? You may get the same thing or not. And there's the, the, thing, the thing is, people don't know an alternative. And so when you say, oh, distribute ownership to everybody and blah, 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 the thing that comes to mind is, oh, my God, I'm, I'm going to lose the clarity. I'm going to lose you know, all that's going to go out the door, the baby and the bathwater, and uh, and fear is a very strong motivator to the wrong thing. Uh, so, um, so yeah, co-ownership is absolutely important. Uh, without it, it's just we're self-organized, but I still keep all the all the goodies that comes to the company, and I get to have the strategic voice, whether it's right or not whether it's appropriate or not. And um, the blog is, has, so far has been on the money, but the day will come when he can wipe his butt and he, he will still be calling his shots. That's not good. Yeah, I mean, I might intuitively, I, I think that's right. And also in terms of, of coherence and continuity of the logic of, of, of all of these different uh levels it also rings true and i suppose the the challenge in addition if you don't have that perspective yourself as an organizational leader or founder then of course it will affect your behaviors in terms of the extent to which you want to create the conditions for the organization to be able to not only survive but thrive without you um so um yeah i, I it's it's a it's an absolutely fascinating area, I think, because it I think it oh, there is that tension between the the, the the visionary founder who doesn't want to let go in lots of different ways, and and yet the um, and yet must, because that's the logic of exactly what he's founded and why it's so wonderful. And I suppose at a certain point you just had to say, well, do I trust uh, my fellow workers? enough to be able to think that they will sometimes make mistakes but like me will in general make do the best they can and come out right or don't i and if you answer that question no then you've got better look yourself in the mirror for a while i think yeah yeah the uh i mean the, the ultimate goal is to create people that can be more like the block and and have the right clarity and stuff like that and uh that's usually not the first thing in the list, is somewhere at the bottom. We have three minutes left. I don't know if anybody else wants to ask the last question. Um, you're sort of preaching to the choir for me. Um, the, the question that comes up for me is maybe there's a piece of the puzzle that um, we're missing. And it has to do with the sort of chemistry and internal appropriation by the individuals that comprise the organization and their co-creation, perpetuation, sustaining of by and between in terms of alignment on values on one end, the shared purpose on the other. And I think intrinsically a property of that purpose it being that it's 
bigger than an individual interest or self-interest. But if it's truly that, and in this domain, the workers in this domain are, are that, um, uh, then the fear about it not staying on course and true goes away. So it's really a, it's really a leader inquiry into, can you let go of the illusion of power and control? Because the truth is nobody has that, regardless of title. Um, can you let go of your attachment on a personal level to power and control? Um, and, and unleash the hounds and trust. And that's a personal thing that has nothing to do with the business or the values or the purpose, you know, has nothing to do with the truth of the business. It has to do with the person who's maybe responsible for putting the stake in the ground and birthing it, but in fact is not responsible for the success of it. If you have the kind of energetic manifestation that that organization in particular represent yeah I, I agree and more and more what i realize is that pe people ask me for tools people ask me for this that and the other and eventually what i think is actually this is a way of thinking and yeah. um and it takes many years i think of practice before you even realize that's true and when you it's you're doing you you and you're not doing it really consistently until you realize that's true and so you know we have to work at it long term each of us i might elaborate on that for a second um sure, go ahead. i'm discovering that when you hit systems like this there's this visceral response we are so normalized and acclimated to systems of mistrust and systems of coercion basically uh, for employment, for education, for everything else, that when we hit a system that's designed from trust, from an assumption that most people would like to help, um, our sphincter tightens, our throat jams up, <laughs> like all, all systems go, oh my God, this can't possibly work. And I, I wrote a post I'll put in the chat called the two oh shits. And it's like, the first oh shit is, what idiot designed the system? The, this couldn't possibly work because it runs against everything I've been taught, everything I've ever done. The second oh shit is, Oh shit! This seems to be working. <laughs> like, how, um, how do I, how do I get more? I got yeah. what I asked for. <laughs> yeah. a, a a a practical example of that, Jerry. At some point in time, after my mind had changed and I was still doing a little legal practice, and Doug, you'll understand this. I showed up as a nice person to other lawyers, and it was totally disarming because they hadn't. The foggiest idea of where I was coming from or what I was doing or what kind of animal that I was. It was just amazing. Who yeah. is this guy and why is he doing that? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What's the trick? <laughs> Absolutely. So, thank you very much for being part of this and, and really appreciate it. And it generated a lot of a lot of interest and a lot of reactions. And well, Jerry, in touch with you guys. Great. Hey, Jerry, I want to know how you did that trick of having your screen. Ah, your ah. I, I, I used, a, uh, are you familiar with OBS? OBS is like a virtual camera system that's way too complicated for muggles oh. to use. Uh, okay. There's a friend that, that uh, kind of a, a friend who's a, a geek who did a subset of OBS, which is open source. I'm using that to do a, basically a virtual camera that lets me change my background. Um, and it is called Flow TriCast. I'll type it in the chat. Please. So Thank you all very much for being part of this. It was it was really exciting today. So good to uh, see everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank Have you, Brendan. Brendan. Thank, Thank you, Brendan. Thanks all. Bye bye.